The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening. This is Lowe's Moore and welcome back to The Blueprint Podcast. Uh, look, I'm really excited to be back this, this week. Um, I'm looking forward. La I mean, let me say, last week was just such an awesome, uh, awesome interview because it was a little bit different. Because you know, some people you you uh, you know, uh, and and some people you know, you know, they're like with Milton, uh, Pastor Milton Van last week. Uh, Milton and I go back uh, when he was just a young man. I mean, when I mean young man, I'm talking about seven, eight, nine years old at the boys club in Mount Vernon. And it was just to be able to reminisce. Um, and you, I guess you always wonder, like for for teachers and for coaches, you know, like remembering your first coach um, or, or remembering your first uh, teacher. Um, I, I remember uh, it was a. I was terrified of a teacher. His name was Mr. White. And, um, you know, from the first time he, I didn't know, I didn't know if you could do this when you're young as a teacher, if you could be, um, I don't know if it was abusive or punishment, you know, but <laughs> I was scared of that guy, man. Um, and he, he looked, he looked like he was mean. And I think I was in the first grade and, or second grade, and and uh, he he uh, one of my friends did something wrong, and he took out a ruler and he banged his knuckles with that ruler. Man, I was like, oh man, I, you know, I needed I needed to straighten up. So is you know some things you just have, uh, you know, you just remember some things. And then I had uh, a teacher, Miss Sherman. It was a third grade teacher, and and uh, you know she she used to you know, always say to me, don't let anybody give you anything. And then she was Caucasian. And she said, don't, don't let anybody give you anything, whatever you get, you work for. And, you know, and then I remember Miss Cohen, Miss Cohen was my art teacher. She used to always encourage me in spite of what my artwork looked like. And uh, I, I like to think I was pretty decent back then. So, you know, so listening and reminiscing last week with Milton, uh, last week was just awesome, man. Just reminiscing about him being a, a young man at the boys club and, and, and myself and Mr. Jones and Mr. Coleman and Miss Andrea Brown and CJ and all of the staff that was there. Uh, and then to see the kind of impact that we were able to have in supporting parents uh, with the development of their kids. And I mean, it was just so powerful last week. Uh, to have Milton on and then to see him become this pastor, uh, you know, this artist. Uh, he always had a beautiful voice, man, and just a great personality, right? It really touched my heart. And I, I meant it last week when I said uh, one of, you know, some of my most listened to music is his, uh, his albums. Um, they are anointed and they have power. Uh, in, in his words and when he sings. I mean, just gifted. Uh, that's what the name of the show last week was, Gifted. And so I want to thank Wilt, uh, Milton for taking time out of his busy schedule and, and, and coming on the show. So it was just, just powerful. And we are expecting the same thing uh, this week. And as you can see, I got my, this is a you know, miniature basketball, but this is my pebble. Right. And uh, when I wrote my book from the Boys and Girls Club to the NBA Life on the Now Row, uh, Denzel Washington said that my life was like a pebble. Right. That was if you throw it in a pond or a river, you get a ripple effect. And we believe that the Blueprint podcast has a ripple effect. We just don't know what kind of impact it's going to have tonight 
or a week from now or a month from now or a year from now. We just hope that the individuals that come on the show that shares their experiences and their tr and they're transparent and they say such powerful things that that we believe that somewhere down the road is going to impact their words are going their life their life experience is going to impact someone and, and so i dropped this pebble into the pond and we're expecting to have a great time tonight and i'm looking forward to tonight's guest and i want to jump right into it um with the book of the week well, really, it's the magazine. As well as I love books, I always love magazines as well, and particularly magazines that had impact in my life, like, of course, Sports Illustrator, uh, Ebony Magazine, um, Jet Magazine. But this, and and you know, from time to time, I used to love what uh, you know, opening up People Magazine, and it, it was you know awesome reading some of those articles in there as well. Occasionally, as I as I grew up and matured, uh, GQ, I became a big fan of GQ. Not always the clothes, you know, but the stories that come in there. But this, this magazine is called uh, the African American uh, Golf Digest. And some a few years ago, I met a gentleman who, who worked for this magazine. I think they were out of Long Island or, or, or they were part of another African and African American golf organization. But, um, you know, my guest tonight was on the cover uh, of this magazine. And, it, you know, because sometimes you can read golf digests, but it doesn't really say anything. It is not as diverse as you want it to be. Right. But so I didn't even know that, you know, back in the day that there was a uh, African American Golf Digest, and 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 so if you get a chance, man, just uh, you know, you know, go online and and look it up, and and some amazing, just some amazing stories uh, about the history of golf, and and the many people that have uh, put you know made a career out of out of golf, and so yeah, it's called African American. Uh, African American Golf Digest. So check that out. And this week's word of the week is listen. I, I mean, for me, this is the most Im for me, this is the most important word. I mean, yeah, you we hear a lot of things. Like you're gonna hear a lot of things on the show tonight. You hear a lot of things, but that doesn't mean you're listening. It means just you just heard something. It doesn't mean that you listen to it, that you brought understanding to what you were listening to right i used to hear a lot of things in the classroom man and i said you know listen to the teacher listen to the professor and then when i got back to my room or got back or got home you know i didn't remember anything because there's a difference between hearing and listening uh, so listening is a very important powerful thing when you listen you gain understanding man and that's why it's so important that the, the first thing I was able to do when I was entering into my basketball career, it was my ability to listen to what the coach was saying. Listening to being able to listen to the coach kept me out of a lot of punishment. And, uh, and, and, and being able to listen to my mom was so important because, it, again, man, it kept me out of trouble. So, man, if you if you can grasp or master listening, right, you will be effective and you'll be able to accomplish any and everything that you want to accomplish with your ability to listen, because when you listen, you gain understanding. So <laughs> uh, that's a very powerful word. One of my favorite words is the ability to listen. And then, of course, uh, the Hill Harper, Pierce Harper affirmation quote moment. Right. I love this. You know, I you, you got to sometimes you got to say things to yourself. I'm I'm. I am an exceptional listener, right? Sometimes you got to tell yourself that because sometimes we're just not listening, right? And remember affirmation and when you get up in the morning or quote in the morning, you know, I don't like to hear negative things in the morning, man. I want to hear positive things in the morning. So I like to say stuff. I like to talk to myself. I'm not crazy, but I love talking to myself. I love encouraging myself. And I think in the Bible, David said he had to encourage himself 
in the word, right? I, I like to encourage myself. I like to talk to myself because not, not all the people talking to me encourage me. You know, a lot of people said a lot of things to discourage me. But man, when you learn to talk to yourself, when you have confidence in yourself, when you believe in yourself, right? Sometimes that helps you overcome. When people don't tell you what you want to hear, right, about you, when you know that what they're saying is not true, right? Sometimes you got to talk to yourself and you got to say to yourself, I am a king, right? I will be great, right? And those affirmations when you wake up in the morning, I will have a successful day. This will be a great day, regardless of what the weather is, how hot it is, how cold it is, right? You got to speak to yourself. And so I think that's very powerful, right? And then next we have the music and the movie of the week, right? Uh, so last week we had Milton Van. This is his album, My Life, right? Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy every song on on this CD album, right? As we said back in the day, I really love listening to Milton. If you can pick that up, man, it'll be a blessing to you and you'll be a blessing to him. And then <laughs> the movie of the week, Bagger Vance with Will Smith, right? And and uh, Matt Damon. Yeah, you know, look, my guest tonight is a is a professional golfer and you know, and I love watching uh, a number of golf movies. You know, when I always used to say I'd never pay, play golf, man. It, that, golf, that game is boring. But you know what? I'm I'm a kind of a mental guy. I like to do things physically, but 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 my play with my mind. Ever since the my coach told me when I was about eight, nine, ten years old, he used to say that after you're in shape, after you understand the game, that the game is ninety nine point something. 0.9% mental. That means that your mind is important. And, you know, I didn't like golf in the beginning, but I needed something to challenge my mind. And that's what golf does for me. It challenges my mind. And I I love, I love watching back of Vance, man. I mean, you know, because he got into the psyche of Matt Damon. So I, uh, and a lot of the movies I love too, uh, 10 cup. I love that movie as well. That golf movie as well. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's just awesome. And then later on in the show, we're going to have some curi uh, curiosity conversation uh, later on uh, with my guests. And and so uh, I can't wait for that curiosity conversation. And so without further ado, man, I want look, I'm all right, golfer, but I want to show you uh, my guests. I want to show you a couple of his swings. So we're going to show you a video of his swing. Man, I, I wish that my swing could be this smooth, right? I mean, I remember like Earl Tatum. Uh, they called him the Black Jerry West, played at Marquette University, and then uh, he, he played at for Los Angeles Lakers and, uh, and a few other teams. And I just tell my daughter, man, he just said, had such the perfect jump shot. I should tell my daughter, if you ever see him in the gym, ask them to take just one shot for you. Right. And, you know, a few. Well, I think it was last year I played. I played with my guests. I, I was on the team with my guests. And, man, I just admired his swing. I was like, man, I wish I could swing like that. So check this out. Oh, that's that's so woo, that's so smooth you know i i can't swing like that but you know i, I really in, enjoy i enjoyed that swing when i saw the video i was like wow yeah that's why he's a pro and i'm not so uh i'm gonna show you this next vi video about my guest let's check this out behind it the U.S. Open Golf Championship is in full swing. And while other pros are making preparations for their practice rounds, Freeport PGA pro Chris Arsenal is teaching local children in his hometown, like A.J. Andafor, what the game has given to him. A chance to play. Help young men like A.J., young girls and boys, individuals, and even uh, others about how to network with golf. Help their businesses. 
He was taught the game at a very young age, and he turned pro 10 years ago. Touring the world as a PGA Tour golfer, Arsenal made the promise to himself to give back, teaching the game that he loves to the underprivileged and establishing the Derby Foundation, restoring dormant golf programs in local schools like Freeport High School, where AJ intends to star. And not only am I happy to play on my first official school team, but I'm happy for the kids that are going to be on the team with me because uh, I tell them a lot, it can change you, it helps you mentally, physically, and it's just an overall fun sport. And Arsenal teaches AJ and other young inspiring pros the importance of core values and the relationships that you meet through the game are more important than the game itself. I mean, there's so many different layers of opportunities, but we have to be given an opportunity and purpose. Once you get it, you got to be ready. And ready is AJ to be the next great well, PGA champion. One day, that trophy will be mine. Can't wait to just be out there. And he's well on his way. In Westbury, Archie Snowden, Fios, One News. Wow, I want to welcome to the show tonight um, my friend Chris Arsenal. What's up, Chris? What's up, man? Boy, you pulling a lot of uh, lot, of, lot of archive out, boy. <laughs> hey, you you got the research, man, and yeah. and uh, you know, I mean, hey, it, it, you know what, man? I seen that fella, man. I got to get you when you come back to New York, man. Work on my swing, man. I got to get my swing right. <laughs> Easy, man. That, like my uncle. My uncle Albert always tell me, just swing easy, you know. Just got to get out there and you know, get some reps, you know, with anything. You got it's like muscle memory. You got to get out there and just keep swinging it. Yeah. So before we get started, man, recently you were back in New York. You moved away. Now you came back and you were on it, man. Talk, you know, talk a little bit about that experience, man. Before we get into uh, the rest of the show. Well, I mean, of course, I was trying to drag you into that one as well, but uh, that was Abus. Uh, advancement of blacks in uh in sports with um, a good man the founder gary charles you know him from aau uh basketball mm -hmm. yes so, um, work with him behind the scene to put this whole event together i actually brought the same lady that runs the joe Namath event especially with that event we raised 1.6 million dollars and we hold that host that event at uh beth page about 700 plus golfers and you see all the list of names man it's you know truly an honor you know to uh to do to, to do this you know bring people together and I, when they told me about the event, I said, listen, I'm only calling one person. I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to call Linda and Linda helped put the whole event together while I was here. You know, that's basically what, mm -hmm. you know, what we've done. And uh, they did very well on the first event. You know, it's a great hit. Yeah. yeah. And there were a few picture, uh, pictures that, that we had of that that event, too. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Michelle Obama's brother was there. Right. And and uh, yeah. That's it, and, right? There. And he, so, yeah, he's a great, great uh, basketball coach. Yeah, man, great guy too, man. Just a great guy overall. And uh, that's my, that's my uh, club, my former mm -hmm. club too. You know, when they asked me about hosting the event, I said, listen, let's ch check out Cherry Valley, and uh, gave a few scholarships away. They did very well in the event. I mean, it was a pack house, and people came from all over. They flew from all around the country. You know, and um, it's a great event. You know, Gary did uh, a great job putting it all together and um, just bringing all the pieces together. So overall, man, bravo to, to them, you know. I'm happy to be behind the scenes working with them to put it together and at the same time being honored. Yeah, and um, you know what uh, was was interesting, man, was like, say, uh, what's that, what was it for? What was the cause? What's well, the advancement, advancement uh, in Blacks in, uh, in sports, you know, I would call it, he, it's the new SB. And uh, he did this with the, uh, with the, you know, after the George Floyd, you know, they decided to come together, a bunch of the uh, guys that ran basketball camps and everything. They wanted to uh, make sure that they positioned themselves going forward to make sure, you know, we move everything going forward, bring all the different uh, groups together from all different sports. It started with basketball and then now golf has been, you know, as you know, one of the biggest fundraisers that's out there. And it, you, we had individuals like O.J. Anderson and many others as well. First, and you had Colette, Colette Smith, which is the first female uh, basketball, I mean, a uh, football uh, coach. So, you know, a bunch of uh, big names that were there. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it, and you know, and play a role to help them uh, develop everything. Yeah, I mean, and and um, 
you, you mentioned somebody, AJ, uh, OJ Anderson. I met, I met oh, OJ Anderson back in the day, man. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a he's a funny guy, <laughs> we, uh, and and, uh, and he's a good time. Yeah, you know, yeah, he was yeah. actually doing the uh, the auction, and so you know, he he was he was going after everybody. Oh God! But you know, mission accomplished. We we raised a lot of money, and that's what it's about. And he's actually already committed to coming to uh, Louisiana, also uh, uh, Craig as well. So oh, nice. Yeah. So we, we'll do something maybe next year. You know, we'll go look at the schedule as everything gets clear and clear. You know, and safer with COVID. So we're all starting to move slowly, just trying to pace ourselves. Yeah, and uh, you when you mentioned Chris, that's uh, Michelle Obama's. Um, yeah, Craig, Craig Robinson. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and what is he doing now? Well, I know he just was. Uh, he just took a role on as, as the executive director for the. Uh, I guess it's uh, the basketball league, you know, but I know he's working on behind the scenes, you know, you've been working on that. Now it became, um, it became official. So they'll be sending a press release on that very soon, but he did mention a little, you know, a little one share a little bit about it, you know, his role. And then Gary, of course, you know, they, Gary Charles shared a little bit about it as well. Yeah. But I know he's always been, you know, involved with, you know, basketball and college and, you know, making sure that, the students and the athletes get you know get what they need to make sure that they're advancing as well yeah so uh well that's, that's good man you know because so much so many things out there like i didn't know about um you know the pro the organization you just finished talking about the first time i heard of it yeah yeah and um that's good to know i mean it's good to know that there's organizations out there like that um that we can tap into and and we can you know, refer people uh, to be able to take a look at. You know, e even the same thing with the uh, you know African American Golf Digest. Yes, the Bird yeah. Cook. Yeah. So, I mean, talk a little bit about that before we we jump into you. Man. Yeah, yeah. I've actually uh, been able to work with the Bird on many different levels. Um, I'm going to go way back, man. We did an event. I had this idea of doing an event at uh, Mega Rivers College where I wanted to bring influential uh, African Americans together in the golf field. And let people know about the golf industry. You know, there's over a thousand to fifteen, fifteen hundred unclaimed scholarships that young men and women could take advantage of. But of course, the parents are not getting this information. So everything hot on the press is basketball, football. But of course, kids could have a free ride, you know, on a golf scholarship. And it starts yeah. with, you know, with a with a golf scholarship, basically starting with golf from a, from a junior, you know, into a building up, going to your high school, and then to college. So that those options, those opportunities are available. You know, it's just you know making sure that the, the parents get that uh, information and then the kids, you know, move move on to the ranks, play some uh, local events, and build up on it. Of course, you're not going to be the Tiger Woods or, you know, the you know. It's just the numbers. You know, you got to you got to be out there. You know, really putting the time in. And a lot of the, our kids and our culture are learning the game late. So you want to get wow. them. You want to be able to get the kids. You know, get the golf clubs in their hands and. Let them uh, take advantage of these opportunities that are available. Well, that's going to be part of a, a little bit <clears> later <throat> on, a part of our our curiosity conversation. Uh, we're going to jump into that real deeply, and uh, so I, I want to start out as I, I start out with each show, and you know, three integral parts of of, of the show or questions. <laughs> integral questions uh, is number one. Let's let's. Talk, I always talk about the importance of family, yeah. right? And so I want you to talk a little bit about, you know, you know, growing up, family, your mom, dad, um, dad, experience, siblings, and and then then I wanted you to transition over into the importance of education, and then uh, one we all all three we both agree with, and then <laughs> number three the importance and power of faith. Yes. So, yeah. So let's talk about family. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll start right from uh, from how I got started, you know, and that leads into the family and everything. But of course, mom, single mom, my father passed away. It was a young, young, young boy, four sisters, and of course, me and my brother. So we were six. And I lived right across the street from the golf course. I could see the course, you know, but I would sneak, a, I would sneak a, like a house or two down to get closer and closer to see what the guys were doing. And I was around, I say 12, 13, when my father passed away. And at that point, I was really going through, you know, because I was a quiet kid already. <laughs> Many of them called me a mute, but uh, mm -hmm. it was so funny. But uh, my neighbor um, at that point, I think I was 13, 
cut his grass and he had a, a golf club with seven balls on an end of that street and the club was behind his uh, door. And his father owned a golf repair shop. It was called the Caddy Shack on Pinhook. And I, he uh, let me have that club with seven balls after me cutting his grass. And from that point, I broke every window in the community. And my mom said, that's it, go see your <laughs> Uncle Albert at the golf course. So that was my ticket in. But I had a little hustle with, uh, with trying to, uh, you know, sell golf balls, you know, as guys were hitting over the fence. But my ticket came from me getting an inside defense because I just dreamed about getting on the inside. I knew my uncle played, but I, you know, we I didn't have a relationship with like that where, you know, young kids were being introduced to the game. My mind came totally different, you know, with a crossroads. I was holding the fence one day after losing my dad and I cried, man. I mean, I was just really going through. I didn't know how I was going to make it. I was really feeling lonely and, you know, drugs and crack cocaine was hitting the streets. A lot of the kids were being put in juvie. You know, they were, you know, robbing, you know, you know, robbing in the stores, doing all the little crazy things, you know, they were doing. Much, much of the kids were older than me. And as drugs were making its way into the community, I didn't want that for me, for myself. You know, I said, you know, I guess I was a, more of a loner at that time, always been a loner. But it was something looking at those guys, the colors, and I guess the competitive part, I would watch them just fantasize, dream about getting on the inside. And then one day I held that fence I was really going through. And I made a promise to say, God, if you ever let me in, because I feel I don't know what it was, curiosity or the imagination or the colors, whatever it was. But I know it was a magnet that was drawing me there. Just, you know, God's blessing, man, just allow me to get there. But my my opportunity didn't come until my neighbor gave me those clubs and I, and I started breaking the windows, you know, just swinging <laughs> in the ball. Didn't know where it was going. I was just swinging. But I made that promise to God if I ever got inside, I was going to do something. I was going to be like those kids, you know. And my mom gave me that opportunity to say, go ahead, you can cross the street. She took me there and then I'll, I was allowed to go meet my uncle. And that day I never left the golf course, you know, mm -hmm. gave me gave me a little job around the golf course to clean, clean up things, you know, help him learn. And and everybody took me under their wing, man. They helped me. I was one of the few African-American kids around the golf course, which, are, you know, predominantly dominant, uh, you know, uh, sport, you know, by a. Uh, by Caucasians, you know, and, and of course, back in the day, you know about the Caucasian only rule with Charles Sifford, Terry Rose, and Joe Naiman. I mean, Joe, uh, Joe Lewis Barrow, and uh, and many others that they they broke in it and through the LA Open. So, all these opportunities are, are available now for us to be able to play golf because they broke the Caucasian only rule, meaning there was an invitation only. You can anybody could host an event, but if you put invitation, I mean, if you didn't get that invite, you're not allowed to play. Wow. But sitting at the table with Charles Sifford, just a little fast forward, you know, I shed, you know, shed tears, you know, broke bread with this man. He showed, he shared with me all the, the stories and even his struggles, you know, with his family and, and everything. So I would pick up magazines at my house with my mom, watch all these guys. Of course, none of these guys were in the magazine at that time. It was either Jack Nicholas or Arnold Palmer or others, you know. And my mom would always tell me, you know, you can be that kid, you know. So when I was able to grace the front page and many of the other pages of front cover of African American Golfers Digest, which is ours, and then being in other magazines, people were just was uh, amazed and inspired by my story. And even today, it's even <laughs> ten times full more because I'm back home, the hometown hero, I guess you call it. But uh, living in New York for the last twenty five years, you know, and my mom had a chance to come there with us all, help help us raise our child, my son at that time, KJ. I mean, New York was very expensive for the little country bar from Louisiana, you know, trying to make it, you know, but <laughs> hard work, hard work. And she always told me, you know, hey, you keep looking at that. These people in the magazines, I would study it and I, you know, just daydream, fantasize, use my imagination that one day I was going to be, you know, doing this. I, um, I always had the part that I wanted to play professionally and be a club pro or something like that, you know, but I, I mean, those things were like impossible, you know, because I didn't see anybody like me. You know, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know about the, the I knew about the Calvin Pete's and all those guys, but I never knew I would have the opportunity to meet these people or, or align what I'm doing or, or get them on the same stage that I'm at. I'm at, you know, so that I'm able to, uh, you know, do so walk the same uh, footsteps of these guys. So today, just about about two months ago, I think I had Jim Thorpe come here for our grand opening. And also mm -hmm. I was able to have him uh, join us, you know, as I was telling you about the Abus, I had him join us also. Uh, for, for the New York trip. So that was a great trip. You know, it was fast forward. Mom always kept telling me, you can be that person on the magazine, just like them. Don't, you know, 
I mean, she had little or no education, but the one thing she showed us how to, you know, she showed us how to love, you know, she showed us how to love, respect, and, you know, and and put put a smile on our face, make sure we were fed and, you know, we were taken care of, you know, as a single mom, she did a, a hell of a job, you know, especially with me. You know, I, I look at, uh, I'm a miracle man, you know, lost a lot of cousins and family to drugs when the drugs were taken over the street. So it's pretty exciting to see where I'm at today. And every day I walk into the club because the club is right across the street from my house. Mm -hmm. I mean, right across the street from the, the golf course. When I walk in, I look at that that house. I said, "Man, that's where I'm at." So whether I got a, a a golf attire like this shirt on or a suit, I look over there, and it's pretty amazing, man. Just a kid, just looking to get on the inside, you know. And now I'm here. I was on the inside. Now I'm on the outside looking in. Yeah, that's awesome. And before we go back to some more family stuff, uh, you mentioned uh, Charlie Sifri. Yeah, and he was. The first black professional golfer? Well, he's one of he's there's so many of them that, you know, because of the rule books, I mean, because of the rules in the archives, Charlie's one of the first, you know, but you got others that, that never got credit, like uh, uh the Ted Rhodes and, and many others. You know, you got um God, he was just at the Masters, uh Lee Elder, which plays Lee in the Elder. Mm -hmm. Charlie Charlie dealt with so many, they all dealt with different things because they they didn't really have a tour. They were not invited. So they created what's called the Chitlin tour. You know, the UGA. You know, United Negro, uh, like a United Negro uh, League, like it's called the Chitlin Tour for them to go and play because that was a, that was their hustle. So they would gamble and played on these events because they were not allowed to play in, in the other tours on the other tours. So building on that, building on that, you know, for me, we were able to sit down with him. And then uh, Calvin Pete was my idol. I mean, I just wanted to be Calvin Pete, man. God, he would tell this caddy from 150 yards, 200 yards out, go take the flag out. He would knock the flag, knock the ball in the hole. I mean, he would just hit the ball straight as an arrow. For about 10 to 15 years, he's, he's, the record still stands, one of the straightest uh, drivers of the golf ball and the records that he won. But, of course, as Jim was just reiterating this uh, a few weeks ago, well, last week when we were speaking to my former pro at, uh, at, uh, at Cherry Valley, New York, they never got the TV coverage, meaning if they were playing in the group leading it, the highlight was always went on Jack Nicholas or on the Palmer. But until Jack Nicholas and all those guys stepped up and started saying, hey, man, I don't care. They, these guys are winning. Either you put the highlight on these guys or I'm not coming back. So they started making a difference. A lot of people don't know about those stories, but there was guys like Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas that opened the door for a lot of these big guys today. Right. And you and you mentioned Jim Thor. I met him. Uh, we played together, I think, over in Long Island. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's big Jim right there and my buddy yeah. Ed, Ed to the right. Ed yeah. I, I, I love Jim, man. I, he just <laughs> Yeah, I love he he has such a wonderful uh, spirit, man. Big teddy bear, man. We call yeah, him. yeah. He, he he's he was just awesome, and it was just great being out there with you guys, man. You know, you know, being able to play with you, meet you for the first time. I think. I, I, we yeah, you know, I remember we played in that CCC event. It was a uh, we call all the celebrity circles for people to come up, and it was a CC event with Julian mm -hmm. Phillips, our buddy, Ju our brother Julian Phillips from uh, yes. Pass A L Bernard, Pass A L Bernard. Pass A.R. Bernard. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I had passed on the show a, a few months back. It was an aw awesome interview, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, just just to hear the the history of, the, you know, about, you know, about golf, uh, yeah. you know, and, and but I want to go back to, you know, you know, talking a little bit about the siblings and yeah. and and uh, and and then talk a little bit about education. Well, if you if it's okay, I'll share a little bit about my brother. I I think I shared the link, but man, I tell you, I tell you, it was a powerful piece because here, as my my brother, I guess you call him night and day. I was trying to get him on the program, but he's got a program to go to right now. But um, when drugs hit the street, of course, my brother was two or three years, you know, younger than I, and of course, he got pulled into it. We both were at the golf course. The golf course, the golf course was our um, safe haven because I mean that was nothing. I mean they had the basketball, the local center, domain center around, but you know we couldn't go that far. Golf was the closest thing for us. So when we came here, I started getting my brother into. I was a little older, so I didn't you know I didn't qualify to play in the other junior tournaments, but I brought my brother so he can play in the junior like the sheriff tournament that Dr Pepper you know Dr Pepper sponsored that. And um, Ronald was, would win those things, man. If he win his flight, and he was just good, man, just really good at it. And um, but when the drugs and stuff started, you know, they started recruiting some of the young kids to start selling drugs. You know, they showed him it can make some easy money. He got suckered into it, and he went from uh, 
and from selling to using to stealing, robbing, and all of that street life. So he's been in and out of the system, and and just to be able to you know beat it, we were able to come back. And you know, for years I was very disappointed with him. You know, I said, man, I just can't believe you. You know, you're doing this. You know, you're doing this to mom and, and everything else. So we were able to reunion back to where we where we are in golf before I returned because I. You know, before I returned, we were talking about it, and he's been clean. And I thank God, you know, for his story, his testimony. I really wanted him on the sh on the show tonight, but of course, he's hiding from the camera. I know he is, but <laughs> I'll get him. But his story alone, man, has helped a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, that's out there fighting that 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 uh the drug habits and you know the streets, you know. And it's disappointing to see, you know, how it's kind of take over taking over the community. We've lost so many people, man. I I can't even tell you, man. Every time you pick up the news. Or he listened to something. It's it's pretty disappointing, and um, I'm hoping that some of the work that we're doing in the community can have an impact to the kids and change that narrative. You know. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I, you know, because my, you know, I know uh, a lot about particularly the issues of addiction. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, my wife and my sister-in-law, my God rest my her, so my my mother-in-law, they all were social workers. Right. And so, you know, my wife, uh, you know, is a, is a part of that, that, um, that experience in regards to helping people, you know, overcome some of those uh, problems that they may be having. And, and so I, I, I feel you. Yeah. You know, I feel you on that. And of course, I know I have I've had, you know, uh, my father, you know, I've had uncles and I've had cousins and, you know, and that, you know, when in to that way of addiction. And uh, yeah, it's just not a good place to be. It was great to see uh, that many of them were over, able to overcome some of yes. this. And that, yes. That's the power of it, is the ability to overcome it. Um, and, and so, yeah, and, and then, you know, you have, uh, you, you're a father. Right. And, and so you talk a little bit about being a father and and, and your children a little bit there. Well, I mean, uh, I've been blessed, man. You know, with two beautiful kids. That's my son, KJ. He's actually at my side. Actually, he's here with me. My daughter was just up here uh, last week. Um, actually, this week, it just flew her back. She came with me on the 5th. When, when I was honored in New York, she came. That's baby girl there. We were actually going to the event. But uh, she she came back with me. I surprised everybody here. And, you know, then I had to fly her back because she's getting ready to go to college. And actually, that picture there is at CCC right in the front. Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, but yeah, um, nice. many, many, many me's right there. But of course, <laughs> we've uh, you know, God has blessed us. That's at your uh, at a Nick game right there. He's he's a basketball nut. Oh man. Yeah, so I've been blessed, man, to be able to do some some extraordinary things and um, help a lot of people on this journey. Use my platform. I mean, you name it. I've uh, I've learned you know a lot, man, on this journey. You know. From hosting, you know, hosting events to you name it, Mercedes, red carpet events, Matt Macy's uh, community cleanup, uh, learn how to plant with Home Depot. God, <laughs> you name it, I've done it. Hosting arts event, hosting a, a golf tournament, celebrity events, you name it, I've been able to to create some uh, some pretty uh, fun stuff. Yeah, you have. And, and I and one thing that picture there, I took the took golf right to the basketball courts. That was actually the same park where Dr. J plays. That learned how to play right there. Dr. Oh, J. Yeah. Yep, that's where uh Dr. J's park right there, right on in Roosevelt. Yeah, we don't we don't talk about Dr. J all that much, but you know, when we when we talk about great players, yeah, yeah, in my mind, he's one of the greatest of all time. Yeah, man. And, and really changed the game, you know, from that perspective. But uh talk to me a little bit about uh education and on into faith, because uh, you know, we talked about faith a lot, but well I had I have a you know, very interesting part with that piece, you know, because when I I went to SU and then Southern, but I, my first year there, you know, I guess my first semester, first year there, then I get the, I'm going to do a walk on with Coach Robinson at that time. I think it was, uh, yeah, Robinson, the golf coach. And mm -hmm. um, two weeks later, you know, after I get settled in and getting going, you know, making the grades I need to make, he gives me, um, we have a meeting and he said, you know, Chris has an opportunity for you to do, or, you know, I have a scholarship opportunity for you. And I said, I'm excited, man. I mean, it's a dream come true. This is the same kid that was looking in the fence, looking to get in, but never seen, you know, just never seen these opportunities available. And then I get to sit down with the coach 
getting ready to prepare all my paperwork for the scholarship. Then two weeks, three weeks later, I get a phone call from my mom. She's struggling to pay her rent. And I mean, my, my heart's broken because, you know, well, at that time we're poor, man. We know anything. We were living on the system. You know, dad died. You know, my mom, you know, wasn't working. She was sick. So at that point now, I started looking at everything. I said, you know, my mom needs me because brothers out there doing his, you know, in the streets or locked up. I don't know where he was at that point. And my sisters all kind of moved on with their lives. So I said, you know, let me come back home. So I walked away with that from that scholarship opportunity to come back home. Then I went to the local university, UL. U, uh, USL at that time was University of Southwest Louisiana. And I said, you know, of course, at that time, there's no African-Americans that were ever playing on the golf team, but I, I was a shot in the dark. So I worked night receiving, went to school during the day, popping revivers, but, you know, to stay up. I mean, when the when the bills started piling up for mom, because at that point, I really didn't have any bills, but it was just more helping her try to, you know, get from behind because she was buying, behind on the rent. So I made the ultimate sacrifice to become the man in the house again before I left for college and came back and said, okay, I'll just work locally. And then I started looking at options, you know, for the administration side of the uh, golf while still looking at myself as a player agent so I can learn mm -hmm. the game because I, I became good at it by promoting it and learning the, uh, the, the business side of the game. Business, business administration was my, uh, my major, but of course I never had the opportunity to really go full, full fledged at it because the bills started outweighing the dream <laughs> in the college. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's only 24 hours in a day, man. And if you work at night receiving, when are you going to sleep? You got to go to school during the day. You got class. So I had to talk with my mom. I said, Mom, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to handle up these bills. And, you know, at that point, Walmart was calling me. They wanted to send me to Arkansas for uh, management. I said, I'm not going to do that because I got to leave my mom. I'm not going to do that. And then from that point, um, I said, you know, let me, let me take a semester off. And then I started looking at golf management and that's, you know, at that point. And then the opportunity came where presented itself for me to attend to uh, to move to New York to chase my dream, you know, of working. So at that point, I still was still away from golf. I was just playing weekend golf, more of an amateur at that point, not really uh, playing on a professional level, but dreaming about getting there. So just full fledged, full fledged uh, to set up my family, get my my family set up in, uh, in New York. And then um, same time, you know, building up, building up and. When the company I worked for in car sales found out that I was a golfer, they sent me out to all the uh, the events. So it worked out in my favor, you know, to be able to go mm -hmm. to Las Vegas and travel around the country, Atlanta, with all the different car brands. I'm going way back. Saab, you remember the Saabs? Oh yeah, I remember yeah. Saab. <laughs> so I'm going. You know, he sent me all over the country. You know, learning. You know, present presenting the brand, but at the same time, um, I was able to play golf in all these islands because they were they were sponsoring a lot of these events. So it worked in my favor where and I was able to, you know, continue to stay close to the game and then meeting other individuals, you know, earn this journey to be able to um, learn the game, you know, start hosting events locally in Brooklyn and, and build up, build up. And then, you know, we moved the family to Long Island at that point. Now I said, OK, this is what I want to do. So I went full fledged into golf and that's why I wound up moving into the PGA. But going back to the numbers, I don't know if you saw it, but I'm going to just mention that when I move back home, I'm going to kind of go a little far, for, give you the numbers. The PGA has 29,000 members mm -hmm. in the organization, which I mean, club pros or assistants or coaches, something like that. It's 29,000. There's only 165 African-Americans and I'm happy to be a part of one of those. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And when I came back home, no one really, no one really knew it. I mean, we knew there was no African-American uh, pros here, but we didn't know, the, the numbers, the history, the historical side. So when I returned home um, and signed the deal here with the mayor and took over the golf course, you know, really, we didn't know what it was, but the guy from the, uh, from the newspaper call, he said, I hope you're sitting down. I really want to tell you something, man, you made history. We knew it. I became the first African-American to uh, hold the role here in Lafayette, Louisiana. And he said, well, it doesn't stop there because you, you're going to be in the archives officially. You're the first African-American head pro in all of Louisiana and all of Mississippi. It's shocking. <laughs> yeah, that is shocking. We're talking about uh, 2021. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even just give you a little bit on the tour part, as I was playing, you know, playing on the tour, while, like I said, a player agent doing both, learning the game, promoting other golf, promoting the game, growing the game, you, you using the kids. I had no idea what was out there. Man, I went to events and you see I'm all zipped up, you know, with 
I think I was an ambassador for uh, Tory Edge at that time, but I walked into events, man. You know, they asked me who I was caddying for. <laughs> you know, young man, you know, that was one event, and then went to another event. Uh, who, uh, young man, you don't belong here. And go to another event. Um, young man, who what was said to me, uh, wouldn't shake my hand. I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy. So it was three three hundred of uh, of them and one of me. So it was pretty uh, pretty shocking, man, when you when you dealt with it because. Charlie Sifford and Jim and all of them told me about it, but until you experience it yourself, like mm -hmm. wow, what a what a shock! And I walk into some of the clubhouse, the guys were doing drugs, cocaine, bragging about their their sponsorship money. You know, they got their hundred thousand for the year, so they can play golf all year because they'll be able to cover their bills at home, any obligation, cover their their tour fees. You know, you name it, they've been able to do it. I'm down to my last ten thousand. I said, Lord, I can't go too far with this. I'm sleeping in the car, eating. Uh, 99 cent burgers, sleeping in the hotel car, in, in my car in the hotel so I could be safe. Because I mean, I'm traveling, man. I'm on the road trying to make this thing. So at this point, I say, what I'm going to do? You know, I said, I looked at God, looked up, and, you know, I got out of the car. I said, God, I can't do this anymore. You know, I can't. I got to I gotta start making sense of this. I got a family to feed. And, you know, of course, I had money at home. But of course, you don't want to go on your own with money. You got to make sure you got to take your family's baby to eat, your kids and everything. So at that point, I said, you know, I got to focus on something else. So what I did, I started using my platform to promote the game, develop develop um, my foundation, the Derby Foundation. And then it all positioned me, all the work that I did in New York, running fast the way I was doing it, it. I was able to walk right into Louisiana and basically in six months, just, you know, with a snap of my finger, do a half a dozen events and inspire the community, do cl community cleanups, you know, tap into other uh, into resources that were that were uh unknown and inspire and use my story so it's pretty exciting to see all the stuff that's happened as i shared all the articles man it's it's uh it's pretty exciting yeah so i'm gonna you uh i'm gonna ask you a question and then i'm gonna re-enter this thing i gotta go back for some reason i'm freezing but uh um so talk to me a little bit more about uh Let's see about golf and and uh and yeah I'll, I'll be right back just talk, talk a little bit more about that about that uh talk yeah. a little bit about faith i'll be right back yeah i'll say uh on the faith part i mean i don't know how i would be able to to do this man i mean for me standing defense to the to uh from a young boy to a man now i don't know how i would be able to do it you know i'll be honest with you without god what what i believe in that i could uh move forward in, in a journey. I mean, I had at least, you know, I had no ideas, you know, that I would be facing these things, you know, you know, a lot of the roadblocks, it was, you know, it, it was eye opener, man. I mean, Charlie Siffer told me about it, some of the stuff he dealt with. And I'm going to share, you know, it's pretty disgusting and disappointing that he had to go through it. I went through some stuff. He went through it. We all experienced it. But uh, he shared with me when he was at LA Open, they had people when he was getting ready to break the Caucasian only rule with, with um, all the guys. They had people waiting outside his house, wait, wait, ready to shoot up his house in uh, in North Carolina, and they would lock the gate, uh, lock the gate, because African Americans are only allowed to go to the back. They were not allowed to go to the front. They had to go through the back of the gate. So they would lock the gate, put a chain link on it, put a lock on it, so he couldn't get in. They would cut his tires, steal, try to steal his golf clubs, take his balls out, take his balls out of his bag, so he wouldn't have golf balls. They did everything they could try to intimidate him so he wouldn't play in that tournament because, of course, it meant a lot because if that door opened for him, it would open for others. So Charlie shared that stuff, man. I can't even imagine that some, his wife is on the phone. He's calling his wife to check his wife at home, and they got people standing out or sitting in the car outside ready to shoot up his house because he's ready to uh, make history. But at the same time, the relationship I was being able to develop with him when he was, in, when he was uh, presented by President Obama with the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, the Freedom Award, I was at the White House at that time, you know, for the uh, cocktail event. And I was invited in that circle as, you know, one of, one of the golf professional people. And um, just just him remembering me and his family, all, all the people in his circle. It was pretty exciting to see it all. You know, this guy, all he ever wanted to do, man, is play golf. And he had mm -hmm. that cigar. He would, ch you know, chew it on. You chew it, man. And he, he had he said, you know, I had to put on this mean face. And he didn't blink. You know, he couldn't tell guys hi or whatever because he didn't know who was in his enemy. Because, you know, he didn't know it was so bad of a, as a, as a, you know, to play golf back in the South in those times or even travel. So he didn't know who to trust. So he had to put on this character, this personality that he was hard as a rock. He, he didn't even tell anybody a good shot. I remember guys I would meet 
at other club pros. You know, Charlie never even told me a good shot or, or, or hello or nothing. He just was rock, rock star, rock hard face. And uh, he was just at, in killer mode and he was looking to beat you. Hmm. So Charlie, uh, Charlie had to do what was best for Charlie. Jim thought was a whole different thing. Like today, Jim is 72. Jim is still getting booked all around the country because of his personality. And if I'm a, I've been able to learn some stuff from Jim and even the tour part, you know, you know, how to keep this thing going. And he said, Chris, work on the administration side. You know, you're going to be able to do things that a lot of the guys, everybody's just trying to play the game. They're not learning the business. And that's what I've been able to do, learn the business of the game. And as you know, like the old saying, the deals are made on the golf course. That's where they're made on the golf course. Mm. Some of the largest deals in the world are made on the golf course. All the professional athletes, I don't care what sport, they're all on the golf course now playing golf. And some way, somehow, their agent, marketing people, press, all tried to get them on the golf course. Those, those guys never saw it. But today, those guys are all on the golf course. John Starks, uh, O.J. Anderson, Dr. J, Lawrence Taylor, you name it. All that circle that we're a part of every year, you know, when we, we bring us all together, you know, we're all a part of those circles. We see all the guys from the different sports. So golf is, is a way that you can connect with business locally, nationally, international, worldwide. I mean, this is a phenomenal sport, competitive, fun, family. You know, it's, a, it's just a very interesting sport. And I think everybody, anybody can do it. So I'm looking at ways now today that I can grow the game, get nine golfers on the golf course. So pretty excited. Yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit more as we, uh, you know, slide in. I'm sure we're going to continue to talk about faith. Um, talk to me a little bit about when you talk about, you know, the playing side, which is, you know, we, we, what we see is either somebody, you know, going to college and then playing in high school, going to college and then uh, going into the pros or good enough just to go into the pros. And we're just looking at the side of, of the game, which is, the playing side, right? And what you mean by uh, golf administration in, in regards to a career? Well, two, that's two sides. Administration like here, I run the golf course here. That's the administration side. I'm a club pro and a professional golfer. I have both titles. I never gave that title up because one of those doors was going to kick off the hinges while I was building up, you know, developing. I mean, golf is very expensive, you know, the, the equipment. You know, I remember back in the day, man, I had to sew and, and have mama and all of them sold my, my name on my on my hats and everything, my bags, because I couldn't get it, you know, just to fit in, man. Just to fit in. I would have them sew the uh, the, the patches on. I, I cut it out, buy it, buy it from the store, cut it out, and put it on so I could fit in like I was one of them. So I was faking it till I make it. Mm -hmm. That's the that's two sides of it. The club pro administration that runs the golf courses, the local that run the golf courses and maintain them and manage them that's the that's the club pro that's the pga of america then you have the pga tour which you see on tv mm -hmm. two sides the guys like tiger and jim and many others i've experienced both but if i said i'm going to invest into this career i need to have both titles like today i can go out there now and and, and do it because i'm in a I'm, I'm in position to do it i made a name for myself and my history and the history of you know being a historian side of the game and able to be a promoter of the game. So I'm an asset to the to to golf, especially my story. It's just inspiring because I could have gave up man a long time ago when those door when those opportunities were not available. So how a young man would get started, we we'll start off with the junior ranks. You know, you want to start off with the small, small parts. Small first level is learning the game, honing your game, putting the time in, just like you would do with any sport. You know, sleep it, eat it, walk it, you name it, you do it. And um, you move into that and then you go from high school, you know, high school competition to college and then on to uh, the, the Monday qualifier PGA. You know, every Monday they, there's a because the golfers today for the PGA, there's two, two, well, three different tours. And they got the lower level tour, the mini tours. You have the women's PGA, which is the LPGA tour. And you have the PGA tour and you have what's called the senior and senior. They, they call it it's the senior tour for the guys that are 50 and older. But it's not the senior tour. It's called the Champions Tour, which is Jim. Jim's on, mm -hmm. and maybe others like myself. And you know, when you get up fifty, you can play in those tours as well. It's not. It's not so hard in the body. Those tours are three days. The other tours are four days. Mm. So, those that would be the steps that an individual have to take, you know, to do it. But I mean, you got you got to work your butt off. You know, when you look at the numbers, I think I mean Tiger's injured, but there's maybe about one or two African Americans now on the tour. And it's a few of them that are breaking ground, but a lot of right now the tour, if you look at it, 
Koreans, um, Koreans have uh, and Asians have kind of like dominated the sport, just like baseball. With uh, with baseball, Hispanics, you know, they have dominated the sport. What they created was called the Koreans created a farming system where they would train these young girls in Korea and in, in Asia, and and that market, and train them to come to America to play in, on the tours. If we had that same system, we could introduce the minority kids and get them off the streets from drugs and crime and gangs and all that stuff, guns and all that stuff that's happening. So I'm hoping that some of the, uh, the initiatives that we've created can do the same thing. I've been able to make a lot of uh, headway in New York. We had a camp about two about a month ago. We had about 135 kids. I did it four days free. But what I did, I wanted to do something unique. We created tennis and golf, a one week of free tennis, one week of free golf to introduce the community to the game. And I have a lot of creative things that we'll probably be doing into this year, next year to introduce kids to the game of golf and also looking into the local uh, school districts. I've been able to tap into that, you know, in New York made a few contacts and, you know, and on this journey. So it gets, uh, it gets easier, you know, when people see you, they, see, they hear your story, it gets easier down this road for sure. Well, yeah. And then, uh, you know, let me say this, um, you know, we're in this conversation with Chris, um, and he's a professional uh, golfer. And 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 the thing is, this is interactive. So if you have some questions, because there's a lot of us, <laughs> including myself, and uh, who love golf. I mean, uh, I got a lot of good friends uh, who love golf. I mean, every, you know, every spring they're in South Carolina because, you know, for two or three weeks getting out there on the golf course. So if you have any questions uh, for Chris, uh, any comments, a, a, we can see them just, you know, uh, put something, put some comments or questions in there that we could uh, answer. Chris could answer in regards to golf. And, and uh, we look forward to it because there's so many of us out there. Um, and, you know, some of us think that we are pros. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I want to I want to also mention too, uh, Lowe's. I, I know you remember our good friend because we were we were both there. But I mean, I know it's going to touch him, man. Uh, our buddy uh, Robbie uh, Jackson. We we lost him. Ah, right? yes. Which was, mm-hmm. which was of course, of course. He said, "Hey, Chris, you know, you got to meet Lowe's." Uh, you you were introduced me to to by uh, to me by Julian Phillips when we played in the CC Outen, but. You always, Robbie always mentioned, man, you gotta, I wanna get you on the phone with Denzel. And you always mention your name. I'm gonna call Lowe's so Lowe's can get, get you on the phone with Denzel. <laughs> and a couple of times we were close, but I don't know where I was. He said, we're gonna call him. And I mean, I know you and Denzel go way back. And I remember having, you having him on the show a few, you know, a few months ago. But I wanna share something, just a, just a quick inspiration piece that I, that I shared. And I thought, I think somebody that's listening to this can be blessed by it or inspired. And I heard this before and I said, you know, this is how my life has been. We're all trying to, to reach a dream. Don't give up. If you go to bed with it and wake up having that dream, it's in the back of your head. You keep working at it. You can't give up. You go to and for the people here, you go into that job and you have that dream and you still have it in the back of your head. You're working for somebody, somebody else, but that dream is still in the back of your head. You're getting up every morning, 5 a.m going to someone else's job honor that person that you're working for when you're faithful over someone else someone else's god will give you your own that your dream reminds you to go on god tells you to keep going there are people who lives and destiny destinies destinies are tied into you just think if you stop pursuing your dream and goals in life all of these people would miss out on an opportunity on opportunities to advance in life. Don't stop. Keep going. If God said it, you deserve it. So That's people's awesome. destinies are tied into your blessing, into your your dream. And I remember Les Brown talking about that. The people that are, we stand at the at the, the, the dead bed of the people dying. How many dreams, visions, things that they had thoughts of, theories that let that they let to go, they let go to the grave because they would because they gave up. Mm. So it's hard. It's very easy to say, man. I'm telling you, I had my dream. In, I mean, the dream in my left hand and the white towel in the right. And every time I threw the towel down, my dream would not, my passion would not let me uh, quit. So again, remember this. If, you, if you're going through, if you're dreaming, you're, you're just thinking about it. I got to encourage you, man. There are people, 
from not just your family. Yeah, you want your family to be, but there are people, young men and women, their destinies are tied into you. When I returned home, man, I would not even imagine. I fought at Lowe's. I got to give this testimony. I said, I'm not going home. I'm not coming here. It's too slow. I've been in New York, the fast lane. I was running on rollerblades. I come back here. It's like, I'm looking at like, woo, it's too slow here. <laughs> but God had a purpose for me. And that was, that was the message today. Purpose. Your purpose. And I've been persistent. I remember being interviewed by Pastor A. Bernard. We were talking about that. There's three things that we said that was the formula of success, persistent, persistence and determination. That's one thing, you know, I'm going to die trying from that. And that's got me where I'm at today. I've made contacts all around the world. I mean, it's phenomenal what the people, the people I've been able to touch through golf. Who would ever think golf? <laughs> golf is, has so many layers, not just the part is the business side, the, the people, the business people that you get a chance to network. I got people just walking in today, shaking my hand, taking a picture, signing an autograph, just want to meet me. Not, not even a part of history because they hear my story. And this message I just said, there are people today that their destinies are tied into you. Don't give up, man. I'm telling you, write down, go back and, re, and go back to that dream and that goal, tap into this thing, go do the research, go do what you need to do to go fulfill that dream. You're not, it has nothing to do with old resources. Let me tell you something, man. When I first started this i didn't have any of this stuff mm. people are walk i'm meeting let me tell you something god will find you and find the people will find you people are looking for me mm. I, I was i remember i was chasing folks trying to get them you know it's like a guy trying to sell a record hey, i got my record got my record <laughs> i got all these tests and how, how did he made it hi uh ll i've been able to work with all these guys you name it i've been able to work Lowe's, we did some work together with the with the my, the uh, the boys and girls club the mm -hmm. tournament that's right you, you wouldn't believe there are people those young kids that you work with all the kids that you impacted as the executive director of mount vernon boys and girls club Lowe's. pete our buddy pete mcdaniel mm -hmm. man he wrote all these books for tiger woods i've been able to meet some phenomenal people now oh. those people are calling me they're calling me now God has, you know, it's my time. It's harvest, but you gotta, you gotta plant seeds, man. You can't plant a tree in, in one year and think you're gonna eat fruit. I've been laboring at this for 20 plus years, man. And I got a lot of doors closed in my face. And young man, you can't, you can't come here. I mean, I walked away with tears in my eyes, broken, but I got up, kept fighting. My last thing I'm gonna say, remember this. There, there are young people today that, that are looking to hear your story. Your story may be a, you know, you're a business owner or or you can open up a door for a young man, a young lady to come and intern. Take time to talk to them. Plant seeds. You wouldn't believe you. You would not believe what it would do for you. It's so inspiring to see these young men today, young ladies today to give them the opportunity. So I've been thinking for the last few months how I'm going to, you know, move this and elevate this program in Louisiana to the next level. And the, the spirit of the Lord laid it on me. I it laid it on me with the people I've been able to tap. So when I'm when we introduce it, you know, it'll probably be late in the fall, maybe next year. But I'm writing it up, you know, right now as we speak. But I just want to share that, man. There are people, yeah. destinies that are tied into you. Yeah. Each week I always, you know, when when I'm talking to, you know, a friend, a guest, um, I always talk, I always remind them my grandfather used to say, Hey boy, come over here. I got a, I got a nugget for you. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was looking at his hands and see whether he had something in it, yeah. but he wanted to tell me something that he thought was important. Right. Well, that's the, yeah. And, and, uh, also, you know, Damon Lillard and, and uh, Kevin Love dropping yep. dimes, you know, you just dropped a dime there, man. And, and I appreciate that. I, and I'm sure somebody's going to receive that seed, right? Or somebody's going to see it as water. That's right. right? So seed has already been sown, and now somebody's watering that seed. Your what your words will water that seed. Yes, you know. And 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 I think we got a question. I can't. I don't know if you can see it up there. Say, hey, Chris, uh, you have mentioned Cherry Hill. Uh, do you know a guy named is Matthew? You see it, Matt? At where Cherry Valley? Yeah, Cherry, do you Valley see Club, Cherry Valley in uh in in Garden City. Yeah, I, I think. Can't see it. Yeah, you see in the little caption mm -hmm. on the on the right of your screen or something like you see a little. It's like a private chat. No. 
Hey, can we put that question right up on the on the board so uh, Chris can can see it? Yeah, I, mean, I know Matt very well. Matt, yeah. matter, matter of fact, Matt is the. Uh, I worked with Matt before I moved to from uh, to Long Island. When I moved to uh, Florida and then uh, back to Louisiana. I worked with Matt and Ed Kelly. Matter of fact, the picture that you showed with me and Jim, Ed mm -hmm. Kelly is the head pro. Matt and I were assistant pros. I know okay. Matt very well. Yes. Small world, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> and and, and you people, man. I, I think uh, you, you in Louisiana, right? Right. Yeah. Lafayette, Louisiana. Lafayette, Louisiana. Right, out, right outside. I'm between uh, Baton Rouge. I would say between between Baton Rouge and uh, Baton Rouge and Lake Charles, I guess you say the word. Yeah, yeah. between. Yeah, I don't say that. And Louisiana has some famous basketball players, I think. Uh, yeah, you got uh, well, you got Big Shaq. Yeah. What, what do you call the big uh, Aristotle? Yeah, and there was <laughs> Carl Malone, the was Carl Malone back there too. Carl Malone, Franklin, yeah, Franklin. Yeah, and, and uh, then uh, uh, well, God. good friends of mine, my daughter's uh, godfather is Kenny Nat. That name's Calvin Nat. It was yeah. three brothers: Calvin Nat, Kenny Nat. Uh, they all from Louisiana. Um, yeah, I played with Kenny for several years. Kenny, Yo, you and y'all played on the Nets. Uh, we actually was in the CBA with the Albany CBA. Patroons, yeah, gotcha. and uh, and Kenny was with me, and um, I his brother Calvin played for the Nat the Nets, but I came after him. Got it. Got and it. he and he had moved on, and his brother Kenny went to play for the Utah Jazz, and he became assistant coach of Utah Jazz, head coach of uh, Sacramento Kings, you know, and so they're they're godparents to my uh, youngest daughter. You know, so yeah, that's awesome, man. And um, yeah, that that was that that was really. I want to have this uh, curiosity conversation, man, because how how do we, you know? And, and I'll tell you, uh, I don't know if it was you. You would know more than me. That's the question down there. Yeah. You know, uh, how can we get more blacks participating in golf at the collegiate and professional levels? Creating a farming system. We got to create a farming system just like the, you know, the individuals overseas have uh, created. And I think, you know, you got to start with like programs. That's why Jim and I have been working together. We're going to introduce thousands of kids to the game of golf. Thousands. That's the only way you're going to be able to get because you can't introduce four or five and expect uh, one, of, one of those guys to be that's going to go through the ranks. You got to introduce thousands of kids to the game of golf. Hmm. You know, through the ranks, it's just like basketball. You know, you're going to have the numbers. You know, it's a numbers game. The more people you introduce to the game, whether it be a young boy, or young girl, they're going to follow through it, through it. And um, that's something that me, my mentor, Eugene Mallory, I discussed when we started looking at the statistics of the game, the real numbers, the hardcore numbers. Mm -hmm. And minorities uh, uh, through collegiate level, you have a, a lot of great, you know, talent out there. But you, you need to be able to have a system, some type of system where you can go around the country introducing kids to the game and you can start through your schools. You know, that's what one of the things that we're working on right now. I was just approached last week about uh, working with all 35,000 kids in our school district it was pretty, which was pretty phenomenal. You know, take a couple of years to be able to do this. But, you know, I have all the, you know, all the contacts and resources to be able to do this because a lot of guys that love golf. And we're going to start probably with, with several of the schools. But one of the schools basically is is bringing back uh, the golf team back to my old high school where I, where I played. I went to state a couple of years in a row. So it was pretty exciting. And then on to college, you know. So using my yeah. story is, is pretty, pretty, pretty genuine and uh, you know, authentic and, and real because I'm one of the kids from the community. And then to make make, you know, make a name for myself and the business. And I own the pro shop and, the, and the, uh, I own the pro shop and the restaurant here, the golf course. And I manage the whole grounds, all everything. So it's it's pretty it's pretty cool, man. So to, uh, to, now one of, one of the interesting things is, is I was researching that you uh, started so people become more interested in golf. Talk to me a little bit about the restaurant and the food. Well, I started looking at what people like. Man, if you're doing food, they're coming, right? Yeah, that definitely <laughs> so food always works. I had a lot of successful <laughs> business using food. I would do. You know what I would do at home buy seminars. I would do pizza. I would bring pizza out to uh, for, the, for the people. I would do uh, credit repair stuff like that. Two interesting things outside the box to bring people. But I would also you know bring food. And then I was going to uh, obtain business. I would go to some of the bus stops 
you know, with the school bus stops and I'd have slices of pizza, you know, a couple boxes of pizza. And that drawing that, that drew in the workers because they were just getting out their routes. I was able to speak to them about, you know, getting qualified to buy a home. So food works. I use that same strategy here in Louisiana because, I mean, you got Southern food, man. Come on. <laughs> Good Southern food, you know, Creole, so, soul food. So we did what's called a barbecue blitz a few times where we had um, uh, we had pork steak, barbecue pork steak, pork chops, uh, sausages, uh, chicken. Man, uh, what else? Uh, what else we had? Man. And then on the side, of, we had the black pot where the guy was doing uh, fresh heart, uh, heart crackling. And every day we sold out. And then the sides, he had baked beans, green green pasta, green bean pasta roll, rice dressing, and um, and our um, a dinner roll or something like that. And were you making me hungry? And uh, and I and I was looking at the interview, man. And it was the young lady who was talking about, man, people were just coming out for the food and your ability yeah. to introduce golf to to the community. Yeah, that's one thing you got to do when you have a platform. You don't stop. You keep thinking about ways. And I believe me, I love living out on the outside. You know, creating opportunities, and which you know, as I just said with in this message, people's destinies are tied into you. This platform has allowed other individuals with talent to have to to uh, be a part of the this this dream that I'm in. They're mm -hmm. a part of my dream because this the, the young man that I had uh, come in to cook, he he loves to cook, so I'm, I have this platform here. I could bring him in to cook, and the other young lady that loves to maybe do this work or do do that work. This is what it means. This is what it means, you know. Yes, I have a website. It's called uh, Generation Sports, and also have chrisarsenault.com. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and and, and uh, for those uh, for you know, for all those weekend, I mean, you know, and like I I uh, I tell you, uh, this is a a quick um, uh, story. Right, and you you appreciate this. Uh, so when I first started playing golf, you know, after I finished playing in basketball, it's coming down towards the end of my career. So, you know, being somewhat of a celebrity, so people used to just ask me uh, uh, to to come and play in their golf tournaments. You know. Yes. So when I first started, man, I was called what I call street golf. You know, <laughs> or, or wood golf or water golf. You know, so because I was either if there was a, a how a road. I'd be hitting on the road. I'd be hitting in the in the water. I'd be hitting in the woods, and, and so somebody said, "Man, you you know, because everybody's trying to give you instructions when you start out. I mean, right. You don't know really who to listen to." And and uh, then a good friend of mine said, "Hey, my coach, my basketball coach in in, in a small college was the golf coach, and he, you know he he's a pro, you know, and his son is a pro at the uh, at this golf course, and so he brought me in. We met." And so he brought me and Nate Tiny Archibald. Oh, God. Right? So me and Nate, he was going to give us lessons. So we're out there hitting the ball. <laughs> and, you know, when I'm I'm getting the itch, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, you know, I want to learn and I want to keep getting out there. Like I said earlier in the show, because it was challenging me mentally, you right. know, because I couldn't, you know, other things I could pick up and go ahead and do it. But golf is not, you can't just pick it up and go ahead and do it. You know, no. you you got to really you got to really concentrate. You got to right. it's mental, and and so Nate's out there with me, and we trying to hit the ball, trying to learn, listen to the coach and what he's saying, and follow <laughs> instructions. So um, so we we finish right, we finish, and I was excited. So I looked over at Nate. And I said, Nate, what's wrong, man? He said, Look, man, when I put <laughs> when I put this golf club down, I ain't never gonna pick up another golf club. Man. I hate this. You know, like that. so you know, some people you you gravitate to it. You know, and others, you just like they just, you know, can't. But but for me, man, I, I you know, I, I just think it's so many people out here now, particularly African-Americans uh, who are out here now who didn't do it when they were young. Right. But now they are on the golf course everywhere, you know. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just it's an awesome game. I had a conversation with John Starks. Everybody know John Starks, uh, New York. Yeah. Yeah, he was on the I show. Think, I think he's got that famous dunk over Jordan. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I got to go back to the video because you know that. Well, he, Jordan came at the last minute. Right, so right. They, 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 they keep putting that up there, but of course we know <laughs> everybody gonna throw it in because they're Nick fans. But of course, but uh, Starks and like many others, 
said they're kicking themselves in the butt that they never started this game when their agents and all those guys were trying to get them to play, even Allen Hughes and all those guys said, man, you know how much money I left on the table? How, many, how much opportunities I left on the table? Because, you know, my agent, my this guy was trying to get me on the golf course. And I said, I ain't playing that stupid sport. Just like what the Tiny said, right? Archibald, I ain't playing that crazy sport. Man, he said, you know how much money I left on the golf? Millions of dollars. Every professional athlete tells me the same thing. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. They got started this game late, and but guess where they are now? Beating that ball and beating each other. So I'm at an event uh, with Victor Green, my, uh, former New York uh, Jets, and I'm sitting at a table with uh, with, with uh, Byron Scott and Dr. J is sitting at another table. So they're talking about uh, an event we're getting ready to play at um, at the event. I think it was the, the dinner after the golf. They were getting ready to play in the Joe Namath event. They were going to play the black course at the bet page. And boy, they were talking, to, they were trash talking. Now, now here we're talking the NFL versus NBA. <laughs> Man, those boys were going at each other. They were still like they were still in the field. This is what the golf does. Man, let me tell you something. <laughs> God, these guys were going at it. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, golf is so competitive. And even today, whether you play it, you, you can enjoy it because of the trash talking. I mean, these guys be talking, hey, man, bring your, bring your, bring your wallet here. You know, they'll be talking some mess. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, when you're when you're an athlete or you're competitive, let's put it that way. Uh, no matter what you do, even when you try to tone it down, you can't. Yeah. Can't. You know, no. you always, yeah. no matter what nobody tells you, you always look in the win. I mean, I, you know, me and my wife go out, and wherever we go on a vacation, or something like that, we always go play golf, man. For me, man, yeah, we. I'm out there with my wife, and I love, you know, the the fellowship and stuff like that. Yes. And, and, and hanging out with each other, man. And, you know, but the bottom line, I want to play well, you know, bottom line, I want to win. You know? Everybody want to win. man. Listen, <laughs> I got my butt kicked on bowling yesterday, man. I ain't going to mention it. Yeah. I, got, I got beat up bad. Embarrassing. Well, yeah. I, I <laughs> you know, I, I don't bowl that often. Right. But every time I go to uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, both my brothers are there. So they bowl like two or three times a week. And every Saturday they get together with about 15 guys and they go bowling. So I left my bowling ball down there. So a couple when I, a couple of weeks ago, I was there. So I picked my bowling ball back up. Now, oh, you God. know, and I go, I go to the bowling alley and they got like eight balls, you know. <laughs> they come in with an arsenal full of uh oh my god <laughs> bowling balls. <laughs> that's know? how that's how competitive individuals are. I don't care what what sport it is, whether it's bowling, basketball. I mean, flag football, softball, golf, ball, you know, whatever it may be, basketball, whatever it may be, you know, individuals just love competitive. They love being pushed. You know, they love that, you know, you get your juices flowing. You know, that's the competitive drive of, of, of you know, of a champion. And right. this is so so much fun. For example, we went bowling out with the family last night and I got I got beat. <laughs> so, you know, I got to I got to I got to come back now. But this is what it's about. Oh, uh, yeah. Again, I really about. wanted to come home and buy another ball. Oh and, my god! And, and talk so to see, my you wife. See, you're, you're coming back now. You said you're coming back now with a, with a game plan. Yeah, yeah I, I got to get a strategy. I can't yeah, be just going down there getting beat because they practicing all the time. <laughs> and you know, you know, you know, it's all bragging rights. Oh, I got him. Oh, go. Come on, come on, man. And they yeah. love it when they can stick it to you. You know, to well, get you in one of the sports. Well, you know what happened was. Um, when I went down before my, my son-in-law went, you know, it was crazy because we picked up a ball, a bowling ball. Mm -hmm. I had my bowling ball and and, and I and I got a little, you know, I, I did really well against them. They like, man, they come down here you taking our money, you know, yeah. like that. And then my mom came down, she's a bowler, and she used the alley ball and beat us. Oh you my know, god. It was it, yeah, it was it was just bad, man. So <laughs> You don't talk about that. Robbie was a was a great bowler, man. Robbie Jackson. Well, well, he, he was a pro, he was a pro, man. Yeah, he was a pro bowler. I seen man. I seen I seen Robbie bowl. He bowled several three hundred games. Man, I never yeah, got. He, a, I mean, he told I don't me even know why he stopped. Yeah, he told me about it. I said, man. I mean, he, he told me about the the numbers. I said, Robbie, you should be doing this on the TV, man. You're you're a pro. Yeah, man. But this is a, this again a unique sport, just like golf. It's got its mm -hmm. own. Piece. And when you got that talent, man, you got to run because you're only going to get a certain window to do it. Yeah. And there's like uh, we we introduced at the Boys and Girls Club, we introduced golf. Yeah. 
First Tee. We had right. that at the Boys and Girls Club. We also had, uh, uh, I think it's the um, the tennis, the junior right. tennis. We had, yep. we had tennis during the summertime as well. And a part of our curiosity conversation is that, uh, you know, here the, the people, and even rowing, Pelham, there's a Pelham rowing club. And oh, our kids, because we, we were at, you know, I took a group of kids down yeah. to a practice of, you know, we, it were no African-American kids there. And and so we went in and we did a, We had the kids do a little test and they they tested at the same level of rowing as the kid who'd been practicing for years in rowing. Wow. Right. But the, and they wanted the kids to um, get involved with it. Same with golf, same with tennis, and they were willing to give scholarships, but we couldn't get the parents to make the the investment of just saying we're going to allow our kids to go or we're going to find a way to get our kids to uh, whatever it is that they're offering. Right. And, 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 and so uh, we get caught up on just and there's nothing wrong with it, either football, baseball, basketball. Yeah. You know, and and uh, yeah, but there's so many other opportunities that are available to us that we do not take advantage of. Right, I agree. Yeah, and 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 here's here's something else as we the time gets short here. Uh, let's really quick talk about the mental side of golf or sports and how important it is to be present mentally. Well, I can tell you, man. Golf allows you, just like you listen, you, you talked about the legend of back, back of Vance, how Will was able to get Matt, Matt Damon's uh, head. He told him it was just you, that ball, and that club, trying to get it in the hole. Just one stroke. And it's internal. So when I went out there and played just locally, uh, just the local amateur events, I was tough to beat. Then then you, you move into the ranks. You start pushing yourself and start going up the ranks. I said, man, I got those guys who were trying to beat me. But my strategy was which I don't want to even share on the show because everybody <laughs> know. But I'm going to give a little nugget. You're, not, you're playing me, but I'm not playing you. So I'm going to leave that one there. Okay. They, were, they were coming after me. So, of course, I was pushing myself to another level because I, when I, I marked the golf course. I mapped the golf course before I played in my head mentally. Mm -hmm. And I walked the course. I, I, I have you, of course, we do a practice round, but you have to play the course before you play the course. Mm. So I'm I'm marking. I mean, me and I'm hitting every shot from from the from the first hole to where I'm going to hit my first shot, laying it up, or I'm going to take the driver and and go around the dog leg, or I'm gonna, you know lay it up and hit the next shot. I was positioning myself while they're playing me. I have a whole different ball game. Mm. Well, yeah. I'm well, that, so so that makes it it, it make, means like golf. I always say like sports is like like like, yeah, like yeah, playing their, chess. Their is trying to beat Chris. While they're beating Chris, they're stopping short because Chris is not playing them. Chris is playing the golf course. I have my I have my map. I'm playing the golf course where I'm going to hit it. Where I'm going to lay it up, go for it, and I'm playing to my strengths. I'm playing everything to my strengths. I'm not going to go and try to hit something, try to hit a miracle shot because I haven't been able to do that on that hole, on that hole. So the old saying, you got to go to your bread and butter. You can't you can't just try to hit a shot that you haven't hit. That's Tiger talks about it. Jim talks talks about it, and the money is made. Is between the ears. That's where the money is made. And that little from 100 yards and in, if you're able to get that ball 100 yards and in, five, 10 feet in the hole, you can you have an opportunity to make that putt. You know, and that's one thing too. You got to play to your strengths. A lot of guys are hitting shots. You know, or or you look at this golf as a whole different strategy. You got to market. It's, it's your it's your business plan. So when I'm preparing to play a, a tournament, I'm marking off that course to my strengths. I'm not going to play it for my weakness because I don't have that shot. I'm not going to hit a shot that I'm uncomfortable with. I'm going to play a shot that I'm comfortable with. And that's how I was able to win all these tournaments amateur wise. And, and, you know, I was actually a candidate for the first big break when that first, that, that show uh, first kicked off. I mm -hmm. won all these events in the amateur tour and then I turned pro and I was a, the first candidate to, to be able to, to be selected for it. But of course, unfortunately I didn't get selected. There's some way, somehow they found a loophole to select someone else, but, but my um, my group was very disappointed with it. But I mean, that's that's things you got to go in and use this, uh, use this to uh, to your advantage. 
somebody just posted that they uh Robbie Jackson used to bowl in their league. That's pretty that's pretty amazing. Robbie yeah, was a phenomenal man. Phenomenal man. man. Yeah, he, he was on my board at the Boys and Girls Club. That's my yeah. mom. That's my mom saying that. Yeah. What a what a phenomenal man. I mean, I miss this brother. I'm telling you, man, when I found that, you know, that he passed, Robbie and I had all kinds of meetings to try to help kids in the in the community. Mm -hmm. Just a phenomenal man. I'm telling you, you know, yeah. you couldn't meet a better man. Well, Robbie and I had many, many lunches. <laughs> Yeah, you know, always looking at ways, man. Always looking at ways to help people. Always. Yeah, always. Uh, yeah, that was that was his life, you know, That's to, right. to help others. Uh, I do appreciate Robbie, and he, he he's truly missed. Yep. Um, we actually started bowling league. My mom, that was just up there, and then wow, the board member, and um, it was a fundraiser. You know, my mom, we call it the. Uh, JJ, they were uh, Jeanette. My mom is Jeanette. The other board member's name was Jeanette, and Robbie's last name was Jackson. The JJJ uh, Boys and Girls Club uh, Bowlathon. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that that was that was awesome, man. And and we were able to give Robbie, uh, you know, an award, and we didn't know that he was going to pass away not too long after that. Right. But um, yeah, he he was he was just an awesome, awesome person. I want to mention it because I'm at that same event where we first met, and I know somebody's uh, listening in, but I have to mention his name because you won't believe the people that you meet on this journey. But Bishop Frank Otherwhite, I know you remember him from mm -hmm. Zion Cathedral. Well, we were at that uh, tournament, and Bishop had said, "Chris, I want you to come and play in that tournament because everybody wanted me on their team." As you remember, Lou, we we were on that winning team. You got to share that. So yeah, you bring that kid, did. Chris. <laughs> but yes. Bishop opened that door for me when I couldn't get in the program, man. I mean, they, you know, I remember walking into his office in tears, said, Bishop, they won't let me play. I can't get in. And uh, he said, no, you come work over here to Sion Cathedral, uh, you know, through a Cedarmore Corporation to get your program started. And from that point, I was able to use that platform to build. But Bishop, man, opened the door for me, you know, you know, and God bless him, man. He told me, you know, you're going you're gonna to reach higher heights and and do great things to to uh, to this part. And he said, in closing, my message is: He said, "This is your ministry." Mm, yes, and uh, I want yeah, I want to say uh, thanks, Skyler Tom Thomas. Uh, he just mentioned about something about my mom. Yeah, yeah, it is your ministry, and and that's why uh, you know Lowe's more the blueprint uh, about personal and lifestyle development. It. We try to address the seven spheres of influence, you know, from religion and relationship into uh, family, education, uh, government and law, media, sports, arts and entertainment, business and finances. Uh, and everyone's call to a sphere. That's right. Right. And so in the church, you know, not everybody's going to preach. That's right in the church and and uh it was nice to see last week um the young man that i had on became a singer and he's a pastor now but he he, he's he came it. right through your program that's yeah, amazing he came through the program <laughs> yeah. and it was it was awesome man to to see and many and just see many people that come on the blueprint yeah right of uh, from their ministry is in different spheres that's right it's not it's not necessarily just preaching in the pulpit right right and it's not words all the time it's lifestyle it's called marketplace ministry marketplace ministry <laughs> i'm going to talk I learned, you from, I learned that from pastor uh bishop wrinkle the white white market marketplace ministry well i want yeah <laughs> i'm gonna call you uh later on man uh during the uh during the week man we're gonna yeah. talk about that man <laughs> and so uh you know as we come to this last minute here, Chris. This has been awesome, man. It's been wonderful, man. I enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be in Louisiana. Well, I would love to go back to New Orleans and get some of those, uh, uh, what, is, what are those things? Uh, crawfish? No, I, I'm not a little bit allergic to crawfish, but well, you don't oysters. Like beignets? Beignets? Oysters from, uh, oysters. Oh, wow. okay. from, from Dragos. All right. I was well, we, gotta get, we gotta get you here, man. I would love to have you here, man. You know, yeah. you come to Louisiana, you gotta come here too. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And uh again, 
I want to thank you, man. Appreciate you. And uh, keep me, keep me in your prayers. I'll keep you in mind. Same and here, brother. Let's talk. You got it. All right. Stay in touch. God bless you. God bless you too. And enjoy the rest of your your week. Um, and to everyone, thanks for your support tonight, man. This this has been awesome, man. Hope you, hopefully again, I'm, I'm I'm expecting the ripple effect from this. Um, looking forward to next week. Um, I have passed. Uh, you know, uh, Pastor Willow on next week, man. It's going to be very powerful. And then uh, we're trying to figure out whether it's going to be a show. It's going to be Saturday or Sunday. I'm being inducted into the New York State Basketball Hall of Fame. And um, and I'm also looking forward to Dr. Randy Clark and the Global Awakening Ministries. So God bless you and have a wonderful week. And I love you. And man, keep your spirits high. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's More and on Facebook at Lowe's More Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other.